Welcome to the Festival of Storytellers. can't tell you how excited I am to be on right now. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks of, of excitement, uh, getting prepared, and I've done a lot of things in my life, but this has got to be close to the top. Thank you. And Reed is magnet, and I thank you, John, for um, putting this forth and taking the chance on our authors in, in, uh, in presenting this out to, to the world. I've, I've enjoyed this immensely, Joanne. Ellie, so have I. Thank you for, for who you are, and thank you, Reader's Magnet. You all are beautiful, and you've worked so very hard, and we are blessed. We, we are. are. I thank everybody that's involved with this process because we know writers need readers and writers need publishers. We thank Readers Magnet and everybody that's involved. I love Readers Magnet. They say, we share your stories with the world. Greetings from sunny Reno, Nevada. I'm Joseph G.M. Papa, and I think you know who you are, so let's get started. I'm a self-actualization speaker. I have some various books that I'd like to talk about today. One is called What I Will, I Can, which basically gives 21 precepts of uh, little tips and uh, examples of things that other people have experienced and everything that seemed to work well for them to help you cope with life on a daily basis. The other one is Unleash the Super You Within. This one is more like a little workbook. It has a fill in the blank area for you to fill in the blanks uh, step by step and kind of get an assessment of where you are at this point in your life. Then you go a little further and there's more things to fill out based on uh, what makes your heart sing, the things you desire, things you like, and so on and so forth. And it will kind of aim you towards the right direction of where you want to be. And it will give you kind of a blueprint of how to get there. And the third book, a little thing, it's called Tools for Life. This is kind of an interesting little thing. Basically, it's like a journal, a day-to-day -day journal where you can write down some of your positive accomplishments, things that you uh, enjoyed experiencing, and so on and so forth. So anyway, if you go to this website, what I will, I can dot com, you'll see a lot of information on these three books. You'll also see what's really kind of cool, a lot of commentaries based on the different books from people who actually own the books and are using them. And you'll hear firsthand how the books affect them and help them, et cetera, et cetera. There's even a, a kind of an interesting comment on there about one woman who says she keeps the book, What I Will, I Can. She keeps it on the front seat of her car. She said it's all dog-eared and everything, and she uses it on a daily basis. And that's, that's kind of cool. Okay. So um, I'm here to talk with you. Any questions you might have or anything, um, I could use any questions. Uh, I'll, I'll hope to answer them in the, the best way possible. Also, I could use any answers you have. I need all the help I can get. Let's face it, we're all going through life together, right? There you, there you go. As I mentioned, I'm a self-empowerment speaker, a self-actualization speaker, if you will, if you like that term better. Basically, every one of us comes into this world prepackaged, if you will, with all of this incredible potentiality, creativity, talents, and different things, all kinds of things, which make you an awesome 
being. But unfortunately, you know, we're finding out with COVID and all the stuff that's happened over the past couple of years, a lot of people tend to become very reticent, very, uh, some are even quite depressed, if you will. And uh, nobody seems to want to venture out and uh, try new things or uh, exert themselves a little bit. So many people now are starting to almost feel like they're victims, if you will, of society. And you think, how sad, how sad, because we have all of this good stuff inside of us, all of this potential waiting to come out to be all you can be, because you're an incredible package. You really are. And you came into this world to share a lot of this stuff. And if we just kind of sit around and let other people tell us how to live our life, none of this good stuff inside of us is going to come out. And you think, how sad. What a waste of talent. You know, Zig Ziglar, one of the greatest motivators of our time, said, it's really sad that so many people go to their graves with their songs unsung. And you think, wow, that's a powerful statement. Imagine how many wonderful new inventions we could have had. Imagine how many beautiful concerto, <clears throat> excuse me, concertos, songs, different music we could have had. All these wonderful things we could have had, but people chose not to bring out their potentiality. So these books, hopefully, will be our guidebooks or handbooks, if you will, to help you to become all you were meant to become. Okay? We have a comment here. It says, your book helped a lot of people, especially those who need compassion about being empowered. Well, thank you very much for that comment. <clears throat> Hopefully, that's what these books are all about. These books kind of uh, created themselves, if you will. I'm not a novelist or anything. A novelist would sit down to write a book, tell a story. <clears throat> Excuse me. I kind of get inspired throughout a couple of years, perhaps, jotting notes down and everything. And uh, when I get a stack of them, then I kind of compile them and put them together in an outline. And thus, uh, the book kind of creates creates itself. It's based on a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, got a frog in my throat. Basically, it's based on uh, 40 years of research, private practice. I had a private practice. I worked with at-risk kids, abused women. Of recovering drug addicts and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Basically, <clears throat> anybody that is unsatisfied with where they're at and they want to go forward and develop the lifestyle that they desire, these books will help you to get there. Okay. It has not that you are not limited. Okay. You are basically your particular limits are the only thing that stop you. Okay. We literally come into this world unlimited. The only limits we have are self-imposed. We create those limits on ourselves. We place them on ourselves, okay? Remove your limits and watch your success. It's absolutely amazing. And these books help you to get rid of those limits, self-imposed limits. I work a lot with reprogramming the subconscious, okay? The subconscious is the programming aspect of our being. Okay, everything is choice. Also, uh, you are in life exactly where you choose choose to be based on all of your previous choices. If you don't like where you're at, do something about it. Change your life. You know, Wayne Dyer used to say, see all things as you desire them to be. In other words, focus on where you want to be. If you don't like where you're at, change it. We as human beings have free will. Unfortunately, so many people don't don't buy into that or use that, if you will. They see themselves as victims. They wait for people, government, society, whatever, to tell them what to do next. Okay? And then you think, how sad? How sad? You have all this magnificence inside of you. Why not bring it out and share it? That's what the world's all about. You know, the Dalai Lama, um, I love that guy. He's, he's fantastic. He's so wise. You know, he said, this planet doesn't need more successful people, per se. This planet desperately needs more peacemakers, healers, 
restorers, storytellers, and lovers of all kinds. And so true it is. And that's you. You tend to be all of these things at one point in your life or another. It's amazing. We come in prepackaged. You know, it's absolutely interesting. We don't know all the magnificent things you're capable of doing, and neither do you, unless you go for it, unless you start to bring them out. Okay? There's no such thing as an insignificant human being. It simply doesn't exist. It's just a person who chooses not to bring them out. Okay, if you see a homeless person, it doesn't mean that person is quote unquote worthless. That person probably has more potentiality inside of him or her than you or me. We don't know. We don't know. And we never will until that person chooses to tap in there and bring it out. And there are no obstacles that you can't overcome. Okay? Just tune in to your inner self. It will guide you step by step by step. You'll get inspirations towards your goals and everything. You know, it's interesting. The word inspire, inspiration comes from, you know, inspire. The word inspire, if you go to the roots of the, the word, it's in spirit. Okay? It's made up of two words. Inspire means in spirit. It's coming from your higher self, from God, from the universe, from wherever, but it's coming through for your benefit, for your good. For, okay, so start to listen to that inner voice. Start to tap into that. Okay, start to feel what it is that makes your heart sing. What brings you joy? What gives you fulfillment? These are the things that are your guides to help you get to where you should be, okay? So many people, unfortunately, they did a survey a while back and it came out something like 87% of all the people in the United States are dissatisfied with their jobs. They don't like where they're at, what they're doing, that type of, how sad, how sad, why? Well, in the first place, a lot of people do what they do because they feel locked in. Okay, I have to do this because I have a family to support. This is the money I need, and blah, 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 blah. And they don't want to venture out to try something new because it's scary. And let's face it, the unknown is also very, very scary. Always has been. That's why people stay where they're at. Sometimes you can have two people in a very terrible relationship and everything, but they stay in there because they're afraid to venture out because they don't know what will happen if they leave their relationship. So they stay in it. They say it's better than not knowing because the unknown doo -doo -doo -doo, is very scary. But I got news for you. The unknown is always where your success is. You're going to have to venture out a bit in order to achieve your desired goals, in order to get to where you want to be because it's not where you are now. Therefore, it's different. Different is the unknown. Therefore, the unknown is very scary. So a lot of people stay where they're at, even though they have all this discontent. And you think, how sad. Question from Jane on the live stream. Do you have any upcoming books? Well, I've got those three. The last one, Tools for Life, which is more of a journal type book, was recently just put out and everything. Um, I do have a, a couple more ideas in my head, if you will, and bits and pieces and notes. And when I get enough little uh, inspirations and things, I'll collate them and uh, formulate a couple of more books. I have to warn you, I, uh, I started out in life as a stand-up comedian. So I've, uh, I made my living off of comedy for years. So I'm thinking of doing a, um, a comedy book with some of my comedy routines. And also, um, I've dealt a little bit with, I've had some beautiful experiences with people, with uh, talking to different people as well as myself, with people communicating with the other side a little bit. And so I may even do something in that, that regard. So we'll, we'll see. But for the moment, these three are, uh, are the ones that I'm doing now. So uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question. Another one here, yeah. 
A question from Jane. Uh, before being in the position where you are now, have you tried losing your self-trust? Well, I don't know why I would try to lose it. If anything, I would try to gain it, I suppose. Um, it's very important that we learn to trust ourselves. Okay, it's very important that we start to learn to become our own best friend. I mean, that's absolutely key. There are so many people, I would venture to say the average person in society basically has an issue with himself or herself, okay? Um, the key is to learn to love yourself. In order to succeed, you have to believe in yourself. You have to trust yourself. You have to love yourself. And that's very hard, okay? Because we're taught from little kids, you know, not to be quote unquote conceited. So we mix conceit basically with self-confidence. They have not, they're not tied together at all, okay? You need to start believing in yourself. It has nothing to do with conceit, nothing at all, okay? You have to understand, you came into this world prepackaged with all this magnificent stuff, all these traits and talents and everything. And we don't know what you're capable of doing and neither do you until you go for it. You need to understand that. You need to understand just how magnificent you are with all of this potentiality inside of you. But we'll never know what you're capable of and neither will you unless you go for it. So we need to start building self-trust. That's very important, okay? It has nothing to do with conceit again. It's okay to love yourself because let's face it, you didn't create you. God created you, your mom and dad created you, the universe, whatever, but not you. So you came into this world with all this magnificent stuff and now you're in charge of it. Isn't it time you learn to tap in and use it and to bring it out and to share it? That's what life's all about. Each of us sharing with each other. What a beautiful world this would be if we all became who we were meant to become. Unfortunately, that just doesn't seem to be the case. Too often, and I blame so much of this on Madison Avenue, okay, with commercials. You watch commercials, the first thing they do is make you feel inadequate because you don't have what they're selling. Okay, if you don't use the right soap, the right deodorant, you're not, you know, acceptable, shame on you, go home. You know, if you don't have the right hair color, you're not like everybody else, shame on you, and so on and so forth. They're constantly making us feel inferior until we buy their product. And that's so sad because we walk around so frustrated because we're trying to keep up with him or keep up with her or be like the Joneses or whatever. And the sad thing is you get all this frustration is because you can't possibly be like them because you're not like them. You're you. And that's not weird. That's absolutely magnificent. Okay, you are this incredible, powerful, wonderful, intelligent, loving, beautiful being. Start to wallow in that. Start to realize that. Start to bring that out. And it's never too late. Okay, I have a friend from Ireland who always says, if you wake up and you're breathing, you still have stuff to do. Okay? Again, has nothing to do with the color of your skin or what school you went to, your education, how old you are. None of that matters. Your age, all of that is irrelevant. Okay? If you don't like where you're at now and you want to change, do it. Okay, we have free choice. We are not locked in. Okay, although, let me qualify that, we do create limits on ourselves. I said we create our own limits. No one else, just us. Remove your limits and watch your success. It's absolutely amazing. Where do these limits come from? They're self-imposed. Do you understand? We create our own limits. We basically program ourselves by way of the subconscious. 
because the subconscious is the programming aspect of our being. Okay? That's very, very important. You know, when I was going to finish my doctorate, back in the 60s, the Russians during the Cold War were doing all kinds of work with mind control. Okay? And when the Cold War ended, they shared so much of their information with us, and they were eons ahead of us in their research. And it was absolutely amazing because they made some wonderful discoveries. Okay, they found out, number one, that when we come into this world, we come in with a matched set. In other words, first of all, we know there are no two voices exactly alike on the face of this earth. In other words, your voice is totally unique unto you. Out of all the voices in this world, your voice has particular intonations and tonal qualities, unlike any other human being, okay? When you really get into the deep technical aspects of it. They found when we're born, we come in with a matched set. Our voice is totally tuned to our subconscious. Or turn that around, our subconscious is totally tuned to the sound of our voice. What does that mean? It means simply this. Whatever you say with your mouth goes in your ear. <laughs> Here's my ear. Okay, goes in your ear and programs your subconscious. Let me say that again. Whatever you say with your mouth goes in your ear and programs your subconscious. Okay? We are audio programmable. Now, here's the kicker. Society, research is bearing out now that society, the average group of society here in the United States, especially, as much as 85% of the people walking around in society today program themselves to fail every day of their lives. How do they do it? With their mouth, without even realizing it. Because the subconscious, now this is interesting. The subconscious subconscious is a very interesting entity. Okay, we know now in research that the subconscious, number one, can't think. It has no reasoning factor or capabilities at all. Okay, it's strictly a programming aspect, almost like a tape recorder or something. So the subconscious can't think. Number two, the subconscious doesn't know fact from reality. It can't discern which is which, okay? So it doesn't know. Whatever it takes in, it just assumes that's the, what it needs to record. It doesn't know a joke from fiction, fact from fiction, reality from falsehood, none of that. Whatever you say with your mouth goes in your ear and programs you. Now, that's pretty scary because if somebody could follow you around with a microphone all day long, you would be absolutely amazed at how much negativity you say with your mouth. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, people say things like, well, I don't know, maybe I could have done it when I was younger and everything, but of course now I'm older, so I can't do it. Okay, you can't do it. They put a lock on. Absolutely amazing. By the time we're an adult, we have an immense amount of limits that we've placed on ourselves. And so we can only go up that high and that's it. And you think, how sad, how absolutely sad. Those are the images, the things that limit us. Okay, remove your limits and you increase your success. You know, when I had my private practice, when I would bring somebody in for the first time and we do an interview, I used to just have, you know, general talking or something. A lot of times I'd say to a person, if I could go, if money was no object and I could go Shazam and give you any type of house you wanted, what what's your ideal house? Oh, wow. Let me think. I'd like a house with 10 bedrooms and uh, all kinds of rooms, a beautiful chandelier in the lounge and everything else. And I would like a, a, a little brook in front of the house and everything else and all of that and blah, 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 blah. And then she'd say, but realistically, a three bedroom house in the suburbs. Boom. That woman, the most she'll ever get 
it's a three bedroom house in the suburbs. Because in her mind, what she was talking about is strictly pie in the sky. In her mind, she feels that's totally unreachable. She's incapable of getting something like that. It's a falsehood. It's it's not real. However, realistically, a three bedroom house is her limit. And so that's exactly what that woman would, would get, even if she was a millionaire. Okay. So we have to watch because we're constantly placing limits on ourselves. And that's so detrimental to us, to our success. And then we wonder, oh, gee, I wonder why I can't make it. I wonder why I can't succeed. It's because we told ourselves we can't. Constantly we're doing that. We're placing all these limits on ourselves. Remove your limits and watch your success grow. So if you remember nothing else, and my books talk about this a lot, if nothing else, watch what you say with your mouth. Because trust me, it goes in your ear and programs you. Now, my books talk about how to reprogram your subconscious. And that's what my private practice was all about. Reprogramming the subconscious for the life that you desire. Okay? Everything in life is a choice. You're not stuck where you are. Okay, again, has nothing to do with your age, has nothing to do with your education, the color of your skin, none of that matters. If you don't like where you're at, do something about it. You can change your life at the speed of thought. Okay, my books show you how to reprogram the subconscious. And we'll get into that later. If need be, we'll get the actual technical aspects of how to reprogram the subconscious. But you have to understand the subconscious is the programming aspect of your being. Everything you do today, for the most part, was pre-programmed in you yesterday or the day before or last week or whatever. Okay? So you have to watch that. Watch what you're saying. Watch what you're programming. It doesn't matter necessarily what others are telling you. That doesn't matter so much. It affects you a little bit, hurts your feelings or something. If it's negative stuff, that doesn't matter so much. But if you start saying it with your mouth, it'll program you. And then that's the danger part. Okay. Because somebody, especially with little kids, I worked for years with at-risk kids. And a lot of times their parents, the people around them say things like, you know, you're nothing but a stupid little kid. You're a dumbbell. You're going nowhere. You're a nothing. Okay, that's harmful and hurtful, certainly. But if you start to buy into it and say, yeah, I guess they're right. I am stupid. Okay, you are stupid. And we start to program ourselves with what we hear. And that's where the danger lies. Okay, the only opinion that matters is what you think about you. So it's important that you learn like I said, to love yourself, to become your own best friend. Imagine how far you could go if you your, were your only your best friend instead of a your worst critic. Imagine that. I mean, let's face it. You're with your best friend or something who's going for a uh, job interview or something. The person goes for the interview, doesn't make it, comes out feeling really sad and everything. What do you do? You talk to them and try to build them up, right? You say things like, hey, come on. Remember, you were the one who got all the good grades in school. You were the one who always gave a pep talk to everybody else. Remember, you were the one who got all A's, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you try to raise them up. But what do we do if we go for a job interview and we don't get it? We walk out of there. Well, Clutso, we did it again. I guess we're just no good at any of this kind of stuff. I don't know. You know, wow. We're always harder on ourselves, it seems like. Not anymore. From now on, learn to build yourself up. Learn to take pride in who and what you are. Because you're magnificent. You came into this world with all this wonderful stuff. You're intelligent. You're loving. You're wonderful. Okay? It has nothing to do with what you, with what you experience or what you do. Understand that. OK, you know, I taught at the university, I taught uh, high school, middle school and so on. And unfortunately, like with kids, for example, they'll take a test and they'll fail the test and they'll say, wow, I'm a failure. No, 
They equate themselves with what they did. You Just because you failed a test doesn't make you a failure. You are still this beautiful, intelligent being who failed a test. That's all. You don't change. It doesn't change you. You come into this world intelligent, creative, and wonderful. That can't possibly change. Okay? So understand that. You have all this greatness inside of you. And it is great. Trust me. It doesn't diminish when you do something that isn't up to snuff. You are not what you do. So understand that. If you keep trying, eventually you're going to make it. You have to make it. Otherwise, it would defy the law of the universe. What am I talking about? Think about something like this. I live in Reno, Nevada now, right? You know, just like Las Vegas and stuff, it's a gambling community and everything. So I'm going to give this as an example. Let's assume you have a silver dollar, heads and tails, right? You take the silver dollar, you throw it up in the air, you catch it, look at it. Whoa, came up heads. Cool. Pick it up again. Throw it up in the air, catch it. Wow, heads again. That's pretty neat. Okay, you're going to try it a third time. Take the silver dollar, throw it up in the air, catch it. Whoa, heads again. So it's come up now three times, heads. So you take it, you're going to throw it up in the air again. What are the odds that it's going to come up heads again? Still 50-50. Okay, but you know, you absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt that sooner or later... Tails is going to come up, right? You know that. You know that for a fact because otherwise it would, basically it would defy the law of the universe. Sooner or later, tails has to come up. And so it is with you. The only time you fail is when you quit. Understand that, okay? Keep trying. Keep going. So what if you fail? And you fail here and you fail there and everything else. If you keep going, you have to make it. It's a law of the universe. Otherwise, it would defy universal law. Okay? Learn to trust yourself. Learn your magnificence. Learn it's in there. Like Prego Spaghetti Sauce. It's in there. That's what, That used to be their campaign, you know? All the good stuff. It's in there. That's how it is with you. You came into this world pre packaged. And your uniqueness is wonderful. We don't know all this wonderful stuff that you are, and neither do you, until you bring it out. Okay, but unfortunately, as Zig Ziglar said, so many people go to their graves with their songs unsung. Okay, don't let that happen to you. Again, my Irish friend, he says, if you wake up and you're breathing, you still have stuff to do. Understand that. We're here to share our uniqueness. That's what it's all about, okay? And if you don't share that, what a waste. You know, I talked a couple the other day, you know, I was talking about seeds and things. If you take, for example, mustard seeds, they're very tiny, like little grains of sand, and you put a bunch of them in your hand, okay? It looks like you got some sand in there or something. Then you take petunia seeds, same thing, very small put them in there, okay? Then you take strawberry seeds, same thing, little tiny little seeds, put them in there, and you mix it all up, and you show it to somebody. It looks like you've got a handful of sand, okay? Nothing more, nothing less. That's all that's ever going to be if you don't do anything with it, okay? It's going to look just like a handful of sand. But if you take one of those little ones and you put it in the ground, water it, let it get sun, water it, let it get sun, Maybe it's going to become this magnificent, big, beautiful green mustard bush, which is phenomenal. Or maybe it's going to become one of the most delectable, tasting, wonderful red strawberries that's flavorful and wonderful. Or maybe it's going to become this beautiful, colorful petunia with a nice aroma and color and flair. We don't know until you plant it and let it become what it was meant to become. So you see what I'm saying here? This is what it's all about. 
you have to nourish it and allow it to become what it was meant to become. Otherwise, it's just like a handful of sand. We'll never know. And that's how it is with you. We'll never know your potentiality and neither, neither will you until you go for it and start to bring it up. Again, these books can help you. They're guidebooks. They're handbooks. What I will I can dot com. You'll find all kinds of information in there about the books. As a matter of fact, there's an entire uh, section on comments from people who have the books, who are using the books, and who are commenting on the books. So you'll get it firsthand. Okay. There's even a. I think I mentioned before a woman who uh, keeps one of the books on the front seat of her car and she uses it on a daily basis. She said it's all tattered and dog-eared and everything else. She uses it so much. Okay. And these books were made to be an easy read. Okay. I wrote this one so that you could read it, for example, on an airplane. You know, you buy it and get on the airplane. And by the time you get off the airplane, you already read the whole book. Okay. They're made to be easy reads. Okay. You could probably read a book like this in a single sitting, a couple of hours. And you don't have to read the book from cover to cover. You can, it's filled with different, as I said, 21 different precepts, different chap, chapters, excuse me. You could just open the book and go to a particular chapter that's relevant for you at that particular time. And, you know, just read that one. So these books are not meant like a novel to be read once and then put on the shelf. These books are basically guidebooks or handbooks to use and use and reuse on a daily basis. That's what it's all about. Okay. It's amazing. I get so many nice letters and comments from people saying, Oh, I love the book. This has helped me so much and everything else. And don't get me wrong. I'm not bragging or anything or saying, Hey, I'm a teacher. I'm here to teach you things. No, because no one can teach us anything. We teach ourselves. Okay. Let's face it. We learn what we choose to learn. Okay. Nobody can hit us over the head with a, a two by four and say, you're going to learn this. No, if you don't want to learn it, you're not going to learn it. Okay. So these things are in these books to share, take what you want, what you don't want, leave. I won't be offended. Okay. But they're precepts and things that have I've developed and have developed from my clients over a period of 40 years in my private practice and teaching and so on. Okay, they're things that work and make your life more enjoyable. So if you want a higher quality, a better standard of life, get these books. Get one of them, get two of them, get three of them. Again, on this uh, website, whatiwillican.com, there's also discounts for books. So you could, you know, package deals, things like that. Okay, these books were developed to help you have a higher quality of life a better quality of life to get you to where you desire to be. That's what it's all about. Okay. And don't say, yeah, but I'm just, uh, I can't, I can't, I, you know, I'm basically a failure in life. No, you're not. You're not. You got to keep trying, keep bringing out some of the stuff. Maybe what you're doing is the thing that you weren't, you know, that wasn't your field. We don't know. You know, I, I give something as remote as let's say you're, you try archery, and suddenly people say, wow, you are really accurate with that thing. And you say, yeah, I know. I never tried archery before. Maybe you're going to be one of the world's best archers, and we'll never know that unless you go try archery. You see, in other words, we don't know the things you're capable of, and neither do you, unless you try it. You know? And you say, well, I don't just want to go try it. There's a gazillion things out there. Well, yeah. But start to listen to that inner voice. Start to feel and think, what is it that makes your heart sing? What is it that triggers a good feeling in you when you do it? Okay, what are the things that you really, truly enjoy and like? Okay, that's your intuition talking to you. That's your inspiration guiding you that particular way. Start to listen to that inner voice. Okay, because it's there for a reason. It's guiding you to where you should really be. So start to pay attention to that. We all have that inner voice, but so many people just block it. Okay. And they follow the quote unquote money trail instead or something like that. You know, when I taught high school, I worked with a lot of kids just before they graduate 
And I'd say things like, wow, what are you going to do in college? What, you know, what field are you going to go into and everything? And I'll say things like, you know, oh, I'm going to go into high tech computers and stuff, you know, programming and all. And I'll say, wow, interesting. Do you like that? And they'll say, no. I'll say, well, then why are you going into it? Because that's where the money is. You think, wow, how sad. That person will never be happy. Okay. Forget the money, as they say. Sure, and don't get me wrong. I'm certainly not saying money isn't, you know, important. It certainly is. Money is the grease to make the wheels of life go around. Definitely, we all need it. But first and foremost, follow what makes your heart sing. Do the things you love. And as they say, as a matter of fact, somebody even wrote a book one time. They say, do what you love and the money will follow. Okay? As a matter of fact, there's another saying that says, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you have to be a bum or a surfer, you know, uh, never never work a day in your life uh, physically. But what it means is if you're doing what you love, it's not work, it's enjoyment. And that says it should be. And what a wonderful world this would be if we each did that which brings us joy. Because we'd fit together then doing our own thing, not somebody else's. That's where the chaos comes from. That's where the discord comes from. Us trying to be like somebody else. And we can never be that somebody else because we're not. We are ourselves, our own unique being. But listen to that inner voice. It'll guide you. You know, I talked, I think it was a couple of days ago, I talked about a jockey by the name of Eddie Arcaro. Now, I come from the Chicago area and in Chicago, horse racing was very big in the old days and everything. And uh, there was a guy by the name of Eddie Arcaro, jockey. And uh, it turns out he's one of the biggest purse winners in the world. He won more money than any other jockey in the world, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, phenomenal jockey and everything. But what they don't tell you is that Eddie Arcaro lost his first 45 races. Now think about that. He lost 45 races in a row. Okay. Now imagine what was going through this guy's mind when he got on the horse the 46th time. <laughs> imagine who would give this guy a horse, right? Yeah. Eddie, have you ever won a race? Well, no, I haven't. But he knew inside he had what it takes to be a good jockey. And sure enough, on that 46th race, he goes running along, all of a sudden, bada boom, bada bing. He wins the race. And he won the next race. And the next one, and so on. And they say, the rest is history. He became one of the greatest jockeys in, the, in his field. But he lost his first 45 races. Now think of this. What have you ever done 45 times and failed at it and kept going? Probably nothing, right? I mean, you try bowling once or twice. Well, I guess I stink at bowling, you know. You try golf two, three times. No, I guess golf isn't my game. 45 times this guy lost his, his races, but he kept going. Because something inside him told him he was a good jockey. Something inside him told him he could do it. He could win. He just needed to stay focused. Something told him there was a light at the end of the tunnel. He would make it if he kept going. And as they say, the rest is history. You know, and this is fact. Because one time I was uh, kind of contracted by a CEO of a company to check all kinds of successful people, millionaires, movie stars, uh, politicians, whatever, inventors and everything, and find out what the common thread was that made them and helped them succeed. And it was very interesting. I took this with a lot of zeal because I was interested myself. You know, so I checked it out and read all kinds of biographies and everything. And it was absolutely fascinating. It took me about a year. But what I found out was incredible because it was one thing 
that occurred with every single one of these successful people. Okay. What do you think it was? What was the trait? Sure, things like tenacity, stick to itness, all those kinds of things. They believe in yourself. All of that was there for different people and everything, certainly. But the one thing I found that was constant with every single successful person, now get this, this is the truth. It was a string of failures. Not a failure here and a failure there or whatever, but a string of failures. And then came their success. Now, a good, well, I just gave you an example, Eddie R. Carroll, right? 45 failures. He lost 45 races. Then he hit the big one and won the race. And then another and another. Okay? So it is with life then. As I said, what have you ever done 45 times and kept going? Probably nothing. Okay? That's the difference between the average person and the successful person. They don't mind the series of failures. Well, I'm sure they mind. <laughs> Certainly they, they mind, but they don't give up. They keep going because they know. They absolutely know they're going to make it. Okay? So start to listen to that little voice inside. Start to focus on what you want. Okay, Wayne Dyer says, see all things as you desire them to be. Okay, you're going to get there. Learn to trust yourself. It'll happen, absolutely. Again, these books are put together to help you be all you can be. You know, I love that saying. I think it comes from the army or something. Be all you can be because that's wonderful because that's what you are. You know, you're loaded with all this potentiality. Shouldn't you bring it out and be all you can be? You came into this world prepackaged, okay? If you take a rose seed and plant it, water it and let it get sun, eventually it's going to become this beautiful, magnificent rose. It has no choice. It's not going to become a cucumber. It's not going to become a squirrel. It's going to become this fantastic, beautiful rose because it was prepackaged. And so are you. We have a comment. Okay. Experience is the best teacher, as they say. Absolutely. You want to experience things. That's how we learn. Okay. We learn through experience. Try it. Do it. See what it's all about. Okay. Feel it. That's, that's so important. You know, you've got to experience. But again, it's outside your comfort zone a lot of times. Success is always outside your comfort zone. You have to push the envelope. Okay? Don't be afraid to go outside of your comfort zone. See, we, we live, our, our particular world is comfortable. We go to work the same way every day. If we're eating dinner, we sit in the same chair every day usually. Okay, if you have a partner in bed or something like that, you sleep on the same side of the bed every night, right? Yeah, it's amazing. We're creatures of habit because it's our comfort zone. And to venture out of it sometimes feels very awkward and everything. We don't like getting out of our comfort zone. Okay, it makes us feel very uncomfortable. Okay, Gladys, okay. I hope you're okay. You sound a little off today. You don't forget to take care of yourself too. What a <laughs> beautiful. Yes, my voice is a little bit hoarse today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gladys, for mentioning that. And uh, I may be losing my voice down the road, so bear with me. Okay? I have plenty of uh, honey and lemon. Okay. Thank you. But I have so much to share with you today. Because I believe in you and I believe in us. I believe in the fact that every one of us came into this world pre-packaged. And that's awesome. We don't know that all we're capable of doing and neither do you until you go for it. So let's, let's do just that. Okay? And so what if you fall on your face 
as we mentioned earlier, experience is the best teacher. We say, okay, that didn't work. Let me go forward and try something else. Let me go forward and try this way and that way until finally we make it. Okay. Think of a pinball machine. When you have a pinball machine and you pull that lever and the ball goes shooting out and then it starts wandering off a little bit to the side, you have a flipper and boy, you knock it with the flipper and put it back on track and it goes some more Then it wanders the other way and you hit it with a flipper and it goes that way and back on track. Okay. And so the ball is getting a knock, a tick, a knock, a boom, a bang until you get it to where it wants to go. That's life. That's how it is in life. We get the bangs, we get the booms and everything, but it's to guide us to where we want to be. Okay, why do you think they call it hard knocks? Okay, life is called, you know, they say I went to the school of hard knocks. <laughs> life, that's what life's all about. Experience is the best teacher. We find out what works and more important, what doesn't work. Okay, and it puts us back on track. We need those knocks. We need those booms to keep us going towards the goal, towards whatever it is we're, we're aimed at. Okay, so don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Okay, and certainly don't listen to other people. Okay, everybody's got an opinion about us, and it's usually wrong, truly. The only opinion you need to be concerned with is yours. What you think about you decides whether you're going to succeed or not. Your self-image is the greatest determinant of your success. Okay? What you think about you matters the most. Okay? You want to start succeeding, start loving yourself. Start believing in yourself. Start caring for yourself. Very important. Okay? Opinions, again, everybody's got an opinion about you, and it's usually wrong. Okay, I gave the example the other day about Charlie Chaplin. Remember Charlie Chaplin, the silent actor? Yeah, it was fantastic. He once went to a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest and came in third. True story. <laughs> the judges thought somebody else looked more like him than he did. Go figure. Okay, so learn to trust yourself. Learn to believe in yourself. Again, what I will I can dot com. All of these books are designed to help you with self-actualization. They're designed to help you to become all that you were meant to become. Okay? That's really important. You know, it's really interesting. We have great motivators out there, a lot of beautiful teachers that work with us telling us that we need to start bringing out this stuff that we need to start listening to that inner voice because it's important and there's something interesting also if you start focusing on that inner voice and starting to work on becoming what it is you're you think you're supposed to become based on your intuition and so on and so forth it's amazing how life throws in little bits and pieces to help you along the way People seem to come into your life at the right time to kind of give you some guidance. Things are there, the right opportunities and everything to give you some, some guidance. And that's really important. You need to stay focused on that. You know, Jack Canfield, one of the greatest motivators, he created uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. Now they have uh, Chicken Soup for your dog, Chicken Soup for the, you know, whatever. They got a gazillion Chicken Soup things out there, books out there now. But uh, he was one of the original creators of Chicken Soup for the Soul. And in there, in his lectures and things, he, there's a story he talks about, a true story, based on a, uh, a little family in New Mexico with a woman, single mom, little boy. Um, the little boy's name was Bobsy, and I think he was seven or eight years old. And Bobsy got sick, okay? But uh, before he got real sick and everything, I was kind of bedridden. He used to always talk about being a fireman. And uh, no matter what it was for Christmas, he got fire trucks and he always had a fire hat and played like a fire engine, putting out fires and stuff. And if anybody said, Bobsy, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I'm going to be a fireman, you know, or a, a firefighter now, right? Yes, yeah, so certainly we have a lot of women now that are firefighters. So he wanted to be a firefighter. Okay, so that's wonderful. But, uh, you know, seven or eight years old, he suddenly contracted some kind of ailment, some kind of 
disease, sickness that uh, made him kind of bedridden. And uh, it was pretty devastating to the mom. And one day she was thinking what she can do to cheer him up a little bit because every day was like the day before where that was uh, nothing, you know, just uh, laying in bed, not being able to do anything. And so she called the local fire department. And it's interesting because she got the fire chief and she explained to him, chief, my son is really sick. He always wanted to be a fireman. Could you maybe come over and just talk to him and things become, you know, let him know what it's like to be a fireman and all that. And he said, sure, we'd be happy to do that, blah, 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 blah. So they were talking and everything. And sure enough, they set up a time, like maybe next Monday, whatever. Sure enough, next Monday comes and everything. And it's really interesting because the fire chief and the guys had a little fire suit made for Bob C. And they came over, the chief came over with one of his guys, and uh, they presented Bob C. with the fire suit. And it was really kind of neat. And Bob C., um, he was able to get out of bed a little bit and put the suit on and everything and the hat. And it was really, really neat because he had the feeling of being a, you know, a firefighter and everything. And they were talking and became friends. And for the next couple of weeks and the next month or two, uh, they would talk occasionally. The chief would check on him and he'd call the chief. Chief, how you doing? You know, and they had a nice rapport going. But uh, unfortunately, whatever it was that Bobsy he had um, got worse and worse. Until one night, it looked like uh, that was going to be it for Bobsy. And the mom and all of her distress and sorrow and depression picked up the phone and called the chief, the fire chief. And she said, chief, she said, to be honest with you, I don't think Bobsy's going to make it through the night. And she said, I wonder if maybe, just maybe, I know you're a busy man, but maybe you could come over and at least sit by his side or something. So if he opens his eyes, he can see you and it can bring a little joy in his life, that type of thing. She says, don't worry about it. Let us take care of it. And she said, okay. She hung up the phone. Now, Bobsy's bedroom was on the second floor, okay? And the mom was sitting next to Bobsy's bed and uh, Bobsy did open his eyes and the, the mom looked at him and smiled and Bobsy smiled. And all of a sudden they heard a knock at the window on the second floor of his bedroom. And the mom looks up and there's the fire chief at the window. And the mom works, walks over there and she opens up the window and the fire chief crawls through the, the window by Bobsy's bed. And Bobsy's eyes get real big and everything. And he looks and right after the fire chief, another guy crawl, crawls through the window and comes out. And then another woman comes through and then another guy. And before you know it, there were like 10 firefighters all around Bobsy's bed. And they're looking at him and smiling and saying, how you doing, Bobsy? How's it going? Every Bobsy's smile, you know, went from ear to ear to ear. And he looked at the chief and he was so happy. And he said, chief, does this mean I'm a real firefighter? And the chief said, Bobsy. You always were because you came into this world with a dream and you lived your dream. And that's what it's all about. Think about that. Isn't that beautiful? That's how it should be for each and every one of us. Start to answer that call from within you. Start to acknowledge that inner voice because it's real. It's going to tell you what direction to go to. It's going to tell you the kinds of things you should be doing and the things you shouldn't be doing. We all have this quote unquote feeling. Sometimes you do something and it just feels so right. And then the converse is also true. Sometimes you're doing something, you say, I don't really belong here. I don't like this. I don't, it doesn't like me. What, <laughs> you know, no, but start to listen to that inner voice. Okay. Intuition get inspired. Remember earlier I said the word inspire comes from two other original words in spirit. Inspired means it's coming from spirit, from your higher self. Okay, very, very important. Follow that calling. It'll get you to where you go. And you know, we always are better at something if we like doing it. Let's face it, 
okay? You know, when I was teaching school, I used to tell my kids, I say, you know, nobody can teach us anything. We teach ourselves. We only learn that which we like. You know, you get like a 16 or 17 year old and uh, you go up to him and you say, learn how to operate this machine. Here's the handbook. Learn how to operate this machine and I'll let you uh, operate it every day. And you think, oh, big deal. I hate this machine. He's not going to learn that machine probably, right? But if you say, hey, here's a shiny new motorcycle. I'll give it to you if you learn how to operate it in a safe and proper way. That kid's going to learn it like that, okay, because his desire is there, okay? So that's very important. We tend to learn that which we desire to learn. Again, these books will guide you so many different ways, okay, to help you to realize your dream. It'll help you to get you to your goals. These books will help you to become all you were meant to become. And indeed, every one of us was meant to become something beautiful, something wonderful. Some people, you know, I... I talk to, uh, you know, I give lectures and things, and I talk to people about that. And some people say, yeah, maybe you were, or maybe he was, but not me. I'm just a plain old person. There's no such thing as a plain old insignificant human being. It simply doesn't exist. Einstein said, every person comes into this world a genius, but we don't know what their particular modality is their particular thing unless they start to develop it and bring it out you know he's in one of his quotes he says everyone is a genius but for example if you try to tell a fish to climb a tree that fish will forever think it's stupid okay and so it is with life okay sometimes we're just in the wrong niche the wrong niche if you will okay and somebody will say, look, you fail at this. You must really be dumb. You must really be an idiot. You can't even do this. It makes no difference. It's just not your thing. Okay? But there's probably something else that you exceed in, that you're wonderful in. All right? We all have that inside of us. Again, there's no such thing as an insignificant human being. It simply doesn't exist. We all have wonderment inside of us. We all have potentiality inside of us. We all have wonderful talents and skills inside of us. But we'll never know until we bring it out. Remember that. Very, very important. But now here's a key thing to tune into also. Okay? It's not going to happen instantly. Okay? It's going to take time. Timing is everything in our life. It's amazing. You know, somebody said we live in the, the times of self-gratification. Young people especially, you know, they want something now. You know, if they can't get it now, forget it. They leave it alone. They go to something else because they want instant pleasure and stuff. Life doesn't work that way. Okay, if you're striving for something, it will happen, but not in your time, in its own time. The good example, you know, I think I gave this a couple of days ago, we were talking about it, is the little acorn. If you take an acorn, you know, that's meant to become an oak tree, you take an acorn, you cut it open and look inside, there's no little acorn in there or anything. There's mush. I've done it, you know. But uh, there's a master plan inside of there, believe it or not, like a blueprint to become this magnificent oak tree. And if you plant this little acorn, water it and let it get sun day in and day out, year in and year out, sure enough, it eventually will become an oak tree. But let's assume we check out, we plant that little acorn, let it get sun, water it and everything, and we check on it five years later, it's going to be a sapling, maybe four or five feet tall, okay? If it could talk and we had a microphone and we put it near that little sapling to listen to what it had to say. And it said something like, I want to be an oak tree now. It can shout all it wanted till it was blue in the face, but it wasn't going to become an oak tree yet. Okay. But if it would just close its mouth, be patient, 
and allow it to be nurtured, eventually it would hit its mark. It would become an oak tree. And so it is with you and me. Okay? There's a time element involved in everything, in getting our success, in establishing our dream, reaching our desired goal. Okay? And we don't know that specific timeline, but the key is not to give up. Because it may take a little longer than you thought, but it's coming. Remember, we talked about throwing the silver dollar. Okay, it comes up heads, it comes up heads, it comes up heads. Sooner or later, that tails is going to come. But we don't know when. Okay, so it is with you. You're going to hit the mark as long as you keep going. You're going to reach your success as long as you keep going. The only time you fail is when you quit. Know that, okay? The only time you fail is when you quit. If you keep going, you have to hit your mark, okay? It's interesting. As a matter of fact, excuse me a second, let me... I don't want to lose my voice here. Matthew Fox, or I'm sorry, Emmett Fox, talks about the universe and how everything in the universe is a duality. It takes two to create something in the universe. With a coin, you have to have a heads and a tails. Heads, tail, in order to have a coin. Yeah, up, you have to have a down. Black, you have a white. Okay, left, you have a right. Okay, two things always to create an entity. A male and a female create a child. Okay, everything in the universe takes two to create. Now, I gave the example a while back. I think it was two days ago or something like that. We talked about creation. And a lot of people were sending questions to me and everything about the law of attraction. There have been a lot of books written on the law of attraction and everything else. And basically, we are manifestors. Einstein will tell you, would have told you that, and any a lot of great thinkers, they say we're here to help create. Okay, we have the ingredients inside of us to create magnificence, whether it's an invention or a concerto or whatever. We all have this ability to create some unique things based on our talents within. Okay, so creativity comes from having two things coupled together to create reality. It's almost like, for example, a chord, a beautiful chord takes two beautiful whole notes that stand alone, and they're both really beautiful, wonderful, good thing. You put those two whole notes together, and you get this beautiful chord. So it's like one and one make three. That's how it is in life. In order to create, it takes two elements to create a third. A good example now would be, and I, I like this one. I gave this uh, example quite a while ago talking about Superman, because let's just say we have this big empty room and I put Superman in the room and put him against the wall and I'm on the other side of the, the room and I take out a pistol. Now I love Superman. Okay. He's a good guy, but uh, for this experiment or something, I'm going to take this gun and I'm going to aim it at Superman, Superman and bang, I pull the trigger. Now the bullet is going a straight line, a straight trajectory right towards Superman. But now Superman, because he's really a cool guy and really fast and everything, he just moves out of the way and the bullet goes right past him and misses him. Okay? A straight trajectory. Now, however, if we change the circumstance and we take a heat-seeking missile and we have an airplane and we shoot the missile at that plane, it will follow that plane. But when that plane goes up, the missile goes up. If the plane goes down, the missile goes down. If the plane goes to the left, the missile goes to the left. If the plane goes to the right, the missile goes to the right, and so on until eventually the missile catches up and bada boom, bada bing, goodbye plane. Okay? That's a heat-seeking missile. Now, there are a lot of different guidance systems you can put into a missile. It could be metal-seeking missile heat-seeking missile, whatever. But that system 
of following until it hits its mark is known as a teleological system. A teleological system, okay? Now here's the interesting thing. When we're born, we come into this world with a teleological system. Now, what are the components? The components are number one, whatever you visualize with your mind in detail and see it, see yourself getting that check from that new invention of yours or whatever it is, but see yourself doing what it is you desire. See yourself in that wonderful, beautiful new home. See yourself driving that sport car that you've always wanted or whatever. Okay, in other words, visualize what it is you desire. That's the first entity. The second element is feeling, and this is key. Feel what it's like to drive that new sports car. Feel yourself becoming empowered and wonderful and happy driving that car. See yourself showing off your new invention or whatever. See yourself driving that yacht or whatever, that new boat or something, okay? Add feeling to it. And Emmett Fox tells us if you have a visual coupled with feeling, you will create the desired outcome. Now, that's interesting. Einstein tells us even further, he says, everything in the world, and in our world, our planet, is a vibration. He said, if you can raise your vibration to whatever it is you desire vibrationally, you have to bring it into your world. Okay, because like attracts like. So that's it. That's the name of that tune, as they say. Okay, so dealing with the law of attraction, we are manifestors. We came into this world creators. And we create, we manifest by virtue of visualizing what it is we want or what, what it is we desire and adding strong feelings to it. Okay. Now, remember, I said the time element is crucial. Okay. Things aren't going to happen instantly. You can't say, you want that? I'll manifest it for you. <laughs> there it is. How do you like that? No. Okay. It's going to take a little bit longer, perhaps. Okay. But again, seriously, the more vivid your feelings are, the more vivid your, and accurate your visuals are, the quicker it's going to come into your life. So again, two things coming together to make a third entity. You create by virtue of adding two elements, and it's already in you. Like they say, prego spaghetti sauce, it's in there. You have the ability to create, okay? Create the things, okay? Einstein, for example, and uh, all great thinkers, for example, inventors and so on, Edison, Einstein, Tesla, they all say pretty much the same thing. They say they never created anything with this gizmo up here, the brain. They say they were inspired with a visual or whatever first, and then the brain tempered it and gave it some finesse and fine-tuned it and tweaked it for it to become reality. Okay, this is why Einstein, Edison, I think Tesla, and a lot of these great thinkers had cots in their office, which is really interesting. And they took naps because they got inspired vis-a-vis -vis by way of a nap, woke up, and then started to use the brain to elaborate it, okay, and fine tune it. They all took naps. It's interesting. So you are never, you're not going to be able to create something by just sitting there and saying, I'm going to create something, okay? You can't sit down there with pencil and paper and say, I'm going to write something right now and do it. Okay, no, it comes to you when your mind is at rest. That's key. The more you think about it cognitively and everything, you're not going to be able to get an inspiration. You have to move your mind onto something else. That's when the inspiration comes. When you're meditating, when you're resting, 
when you're sleeping or whatever. Come, It'll come to you in a dream or whatever. Okay, so you need to move your conscious mind away in order to let inspiration come out. Very, very important. And like I say, that's why some of the greatest thinkers of the world knew this. So they would purposely have a cot where they would take a nap in order to get inspired and so on. Some of the great songwriters even, and some of the even pop artists and everything. I remember Billy Joel, when he wrote that one song, uh, Field of, I want to say Field of Dreams, but it was uh, something to do with, uh, you know, feeling going down the stream into the ocean, blah, blah, blah. But he said uh, it came to him during the night and he got up, pencil and paper in hand and everything. And he said he wrote the song out in two hours, not two hours, but uh, something like two and a half minutes or something. He said he just kept wrote the whole thing and then he went back to bed. So it, it came to him to write that song. Okay, it wasn't like he sat there and said, hmm, what can I write about? No, he said he wasn't even thinking about that. He just went to bed, came to him like in a dream, an inspiration. Then it woke him up and he jotted it down. The song became a hit. So that's how it is with us. We get these inspirations from time to time, these hits, if you will, to guide us where we should be, where we should go what we should do start to listen to those things because they're important okay they're telling you things they're helping you to get to be where you belong and it doesn't take a lot of hard work or anything either. every day you don't have to sit there for you know three hours and stuff and think what am i going to create what am i going to no it'll come to you automatically when the time is right when you're relaxed when you're doing dishes or something, when you're uh, meditating, when you're planting something, whatever, when your mind is relaxed and off on something else, just kind of daydreaming, if you will, that's when inspiration happens, okay? That's when the creativity comes. That's when you get the ideas, okay? Not when you're focused cognitively on something. It has to be when your mind is totally on something different, something light. You're laughing at a joke or something or whatever. Then suddenly the light bulb goes on, okay? You need to kind of move your mind away a little bit. You know, it's interesting. I was talking the other day about a guy by the name of Doug Hall who wrote a book called Jumpstart Your Life. This guy was great. This guy's a genius. He works, uh, he's known as the guru of the Fortune 500 companies. Um, in New York and around the world and stuff. He deals with creativity and he talk, talks and teaches people uh, about how to become inspired, how to become creative and so on and so forth. And he did a lot of research. He had a whole crew task force that uh, did a lot of research for him. And it's interesting. What they found out was, now this is kind of cool. They found out that we are the most creative at five years old. The most creative at five years old. They also found out the average five year old laughs as much as 110 times a day. Isn't that cool? The average five year old, they say, laughs approximately 110 times a day. And we are at our most creative at five years old. Now, here's the kicker they say, after 40 years old, 40 and up, we tend to lose as much as 85% of our creativity. And the average person 40 and up tends to laugh less than five times a day. Are you getting some kind of correlation here? Isn't that interesting? A five-year-old most creative, we are the most creative that will ever be in our life at five, laughs 110 times a day. A person 40 and up, we lose 85% of our creativity and we laugh less than five times a day. Interesting. So you see, laughter, as they say, is the best medicine. Laughter has a purpose. 
Laughter is very, very conducive to creativity. Very important. As a matter of fact, uh, Doug Hall did some experiments with uh, Fortune 500 companies and everything, proving the creativity. You know, in the uh, 70s and 80s, it's really interesting. In the quote unquote, the old days, they used to have literally what they called think tanks, where the chairman of the board would sit around this, and the guys would be sitting around this big, you know, oak table or something like that. And he'd say, okay, this is the problem we need to solve. And everybody kind of. Mm. They're all thinking and thinking and thinking, sweat coming out of their eyebrows. Anybody got anything? Well, how about this? Okay, Judge. Um, you know, and they come up with maybe two or three ideas and maybe, uh, you know, four or five hours of really, really thinking, um, which is okay, but not, not really great, right? Doug Hall said, let me change that a little bit for you. And he started working with the CEO. And one day the CEO called one of the meetings, had all the guys around his table and everything. And he said, I'll tell you what, he said, in exactly five minutes, I want to meet each one of you downstairs by the atrium. And he said, out by the yard, going out by the yard there and everything, he said, I'll be there. He said, I want you to meet me down there in five minutes. And everybody kind of looked at each other. Oh, no, we're going to get fired. He said, I've got something for each of you. And he said, oh, no, he's got a pink slip, you know. So they all start walking out very slowly and everything. And he took his personal elevator, went down there and everything. And one by one, they kind of lined up and came up to him. And he was standing by the atrium door out to the gardens. And uh, he opened the door and the first guy comes up and he hands the guy a squirt gun. And he says, get out there. And the guy goes, what? He says, Shh, get out there. The guy goes out there. Next person comes up. He hands him two water balloons. Says, get out there, person. Okay, you know, they go out there. one by one. He gives them squirt guns, water balloons, squirt rifles, pumpers, all kinds of things until everybody was out there. You know, about a dozen people, and he closed. And he says, "Don't any of you come back in here until everything's used up." And he closed the door. Well, one by one, the people were outside saying, "What are we supposed to do with this?" And the guy says, "I don't know." <laughs> And the guy says, hey, cut it out. What are you talking about? Hey, you got me. And before you know it, they were playing and throwing, you know, um, ball, the, what do you call them, water balloons at each other and everything, squirting each other and everything and laughing and falling down and giggling and throwing things. At, and they were soaking wet and everything. And finally, they were all done. They said, let's go tell the boss. They all go back. They open the door and they come in and the boss says, OK, come on back up. They come back up, they all sit around the table, and the boss says, here's the problem. Let's come up with some solutions. And within a half an hour, they had something like 14 possible solutions. So it showed play creates creativity, creates answers. Okay? Very, very important. They did this again at Yale and Harvard and a few, few of the Ivy League colleges. They did tests where they showed a group of people a bunch of math documentaries. And then they had them work on solving some math problems. And it took them quite a while, and they got they solved maybe half of them or something. Then they took another group and showed them all kinds of, like, Three Stooges movies and uh, Jerry Lewis movies and funny movies and cartoons where everybody is laughing and joking and everything. Then they took the group gave them a bunch of math problems and asked them to solve them. And the group basically solved every single one. Okay. And it was kind of interesting. They showed that laughter and joy and happiness stimulates creativity. So right there, that teaches us something. Okay. So remember, most creative at five, we laugh 110 times. Less creative at 40 and up. We laugh less than four times, five times a day. You know, I was a comedian for years, seven years. I made my living off of it, a stand-up comedian, both in the Midwest and in Europe. And it was kind of interesting because I would be interviewed on TV and things. And I remember I would use the term comedic, you know, funny, comedic. And uh, it dawned on me one day by separating those syllables, comedic. I thought, whoa. Comedy 
is medicinal. Very interesting. We've all heard comedy is the best medicine. There's truth to that. We're finding out now that when you laugh, it produces neuropeptides in your system. This is some of the most powerful healing chemicals your body can make. Isn't that interesting? When you laugh, it produces neuropeptides. So some of the most powerful healing chemicals your body can make. It, it fights everything, disease, cancer, infections, all kinds of things. As a matter of fact, some of you are probably familiar with one of the greatest studies out there by Norman Cousins. He was a publisher, very wealthy man, very big, I don't want to say big shot, but, you know, very well known. He got a disease or something, Some I don't know if it was cancer or what, but they gave him six weeks to live. And he was in the hospital and he thought, nuts to this. He said, if I'm going to die, I don't want to be in a hospital. And everything. So he went out and checked himself into one of the fancy hotels, the Hilton or something, rented a bunch of funny movies, got a bunch of comic books, all kinds of things that were, he would laugh and laugh and laugh. And uh, consequently, he checked out and lived another 28 years. And he owes it all, he says, to laughter. He said basically he laughed himself back to health. It's a great study. You should check it out, Norman Cousins. But what am I saying? Simply this. Don't get so locked into having to get where you want to go cognitively. You know, like, I got to get there. I got to succeed. I got to do this. And somebody says, lighten up. Don't tell me to lighten up. I got problems. No, you should lighten up. Relax, because that's when the creativity is going to come. Laugh. Enjoy. Have fun. Go for a walk in nature. Play with the kids. Play with your dog. Play with the cat. Whatever. Have fun. Loosen up. And that's when the creativity starts to come. Not the tension. Not the studying. None of that. It's the lightness. It's moving your mind onto something lighter. That's when creativity comes. Very interesting. You know, the body, oh, we have a, a comment here from Gladys on the chat. It says, enjoy the ride towards your destination in life. There you go. Absolutely, Gladys. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy every day when you wake up. Because, you know, I had a friend, Leo Bascaglia. You probably remember him. He's known as the love doctor. He wrote a bunch of books and everything. By the time he passed away, rest his soul, he had sold something like 20 million books in circulation around the world on the subject of love. But good guy. He used to say, live every day like it's going to be your last. Because one day, you're going to be right. <laughs> so in other words, enjoy. Enjoy each day to the fullest. Laugh. Have fun. Do what you choose to do, what you want to do. And don't say, well, someday I will. No. Now's the time. Because there's no guarantees with the future. OK, we don't have any future that there's going to be a tomorrow. We hope there's going to be a tomorrow, but there's no guarantee. So learn to do it today. You know, I was a teacher for a long time. I remember I'd sit in the faculty room and sometimes the teacher would come in and he'd be all red faced and the veins in his neck were coming on. He'd say, I hate these kids. And I'd say, why don't you quit? I will. In just 11 more years, I'm going to retire and that'll be the end of these kids. And everything, I think, boy, this guy's not going to make 11 years or 13 years or whatever. You know, he's lucky if he's going to make it next week. So do things now to enjoy life. There's a fantastic poem written by a lady that says, when I'm old, I want to wear purple. And the essence of it is when she's old, she's not going to care what people think. She'll wear purple if she wants or green or chartreuse or whatever, because now she doesn't care. And I say, good for her. The poem, is, it's a wonderful poem, and you should read it. It's kind of neat, kind of cool. But the bottom line is, I say, why wait till you're old? Why wait till you're a senior citizen? Do it now, okay? As the saying goes, do it now, okay? Again, we're almost out of time. Today's a short one. I'm only here for, for about an hour and a half or so. I see we're uh, just about out of time. I only have a couple of minutes left. I want to thank you for listening to me. Please, by all means, check out what I will, I can, 
www.thinkingmindset.com. There are a lot of good pieces of advice in there, a lot of commentaries by people who have the books, use the books, and they talk about how the books work for them. Again, there's even discounts uh, for the books and everything else. So I want to thank you very much for being with me. Um, and I hope next time I see you, I'll see you. I believe I think I'm coming back on Tuesday and I'll be here to answer all of your questions. I'll even be here to take some answers. I need all the help I can get. Okay. Um, I appreciate you listening to me. And if you have any personal questions or anything, you want to contact me, my email is joe, J-O-E, at josephgmpapa.com. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll talk later. Take care.